working on Facebook. It's not working on my phone this morning, and we just got it working at the back. So, um, but anyway, we hope that you're joining us. You, you're enjoying uh, this Thanksgiving weekend, and we welcome you as we gather here for worship this morning on uh, this last Sunday of the church year. Um, I put that in my Facebook post when we announced, put in the link for the service. I said, you know, it's the last Sunday of the church year. Uh, it's called Christ the King Sunday or the Reign of Christ Sunday. Um, the church year follows a different calendar than, the, than the, the secular calendar that we normally think of January through December. The church calendar ends with um, Christ the King Sunday. It actually begins next week with the first Sunday of Advent. So, um, and as you can see, the church mice have been busy this weekend. Um, we want to thank all the folks who came and helped yesterday and uh, put up some of the Christmas decorations and the greenery. And uh, we, know, we know it's a little early. Advent doesn't start till next week, but um, this was a good weekend to do it for everybody. So, so we thank everyone for helping with that. With that, I'd like to draw your attention to um, a couple of the announcements in the bulletin. And first of all, you'll notice the, the, the schedule for the week is on the back. We're back to a full schedule this week with, uh, after enjoying the Thanksgiving break. Um, and the peacemakers are scheduled to come on Monday afternoon. And then next Sunday, we'll have worship with communion, and we'll hopefully have it on Facebook. We're having some technical issues the last couple weeks, so hopefully we'll get everything ironed out now this week. Uh, let's see. In the bulletin, reminder about the prayer group meeting the first Tuesday of each month. So that's not this week because that we're still in November. Uh, reminder about Mana Food Pantry is looking for volunteers. Uh, an event coming up at Worthington Christian School this Saturday, and then on the back of the insert about the poinsettias for Christmas. So if you'd like to order a poinsettia and leave it here at the church, we would appreciate it if you give it in memory or honor of someone. Um, we have some lovely ones up front, but you know what? They've been that same color for years. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, I think that's all of the announcements in the bulletin. Um, a reminder about the table in the uh, hallway behind me with the uh, stuff on it. And notice the date, Saturday, December 16th, is a date we're going to really try to pack up stuff and move it into the various storage venues we have uh, either into the garage or to the storage shed we're renting. And hopefully we'll get all that taken care of. Uh, and then a reminder about the Christmas joy offering. We have the, the flyers in the, the flyer in the bulletin and the offering envelope. Uh, that's coming up here during the season of Advent. Are there other announcements that you would like to share? And like I said, my Facebook is not working on my phone, so I don't know if what? It's on. Okay. So hopefully somebody is, uh, if you have an announcement, uh, put it on there and, or a prayer concern, and I'll have one of the people here who, have, who are following it um, share that information. Thank you. With that, would you please join with me in a word of prayer? Wonderful God, it is good to see the sun shining through the windows and it's good to see your sun shining in our lives. We would pray for your Holy Spirit that as we gather this day to worship you and to honor you, that we may truly give thanks and praise to our Lord, our ruler, Christ Jesus. Bless this time together, we ask in his name. And lead us in this time of worship, we pray, through Christ our risen King. Amen. Our lead worshiper this morning is Larry Komnick. Good morning. 
Please stand, if able, and join me in the call to worship, which is taken from Psalms 95. O come, let us sing to our God. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock and to salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise with song and praise. Let us worship and bow down before the Lord, our Maker. For God is our God, and we are the people of his patience, the sheep of his land. Our first hymn is Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, can be found in either of the hymnals or on the screen. join me in the prayer of confession. With sincere and repentant hearts, let us name our sins against Christ and one another. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, judge of the nations, we confess that we have not seen your face among our neighbors in need. We have not shared our food with the hungry. We have not offered clothes to the destitute or shelter to the homeless. We have not welcomed the strangers, nor have we visited prisoners. We have not paid attention to these, your sisters and brothers. And in our neglect, we have failed to serve you. Lord, forgive us. Open our eyes to recognize your beloved family and give us the blessing of sincere repentance. 
that we may know the joy of eternal life with you and all the saints in the world and in the world to come. Amen. This saying is sure and worthy of acceptance by all. Christ Jesus came into the world to redeem sinners. Friends and family, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As forgiven people, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace, peace be with you.
please be seated. Our first scripture lesson today comes from Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16 and 20 through 24. It can be found on page 1341 in the Pew Bibles or on the screen. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from their countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the water courses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on the rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring them back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed the flank and shoulder and butted all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Here endeth the first reading. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 31. In your pew Bibles, it's page 1542, if you'd like to follow along there. Otherwise, the words are on the screen for you to follow there. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared before you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry And you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took me, you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, one well. When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it 
to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This ends the reading of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Holy, wonderful, and gracious are you, O Lord. You are the king, the ruler, the sovereign of this world. And we owe you our allegiance. We ask your blessing upon the words of scripture that we have read. By your spirit, Write those words in our minds and on our hearts. Open our eyes and our ears to hear you and to see you. Bless now the words that I speak, that in them we may hear from you. This we ask through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew ends with three parables, basically. All of them occur after Jesus and the disciples walk out of the temple and they see the big stones and they ask Jesus about the beauty of the temple And Jesus says, you see these stones are going to fall flat on their ground. None will be left stacked on one another. And so then they ask him for, when will this happen? Give us some signs. Tell us all these things. And he gives them a few things. But then he goes with his disciples and he begins telling them three parables about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven will be like... This is the third of those parables. It's probably one that is the most familiar, and it's an important part of our lives. I can tell you that I don't remember the first time I heard this passage, but I remember the time it became most important, one of the most important passages of Scripture to me. I was in college. I had been attending church with my great aunt and one of my cousins. And as we had worshipped there, I decided to go ahead and join the choir. Imagine that, me wanting to join the choir. Um, I joined the choir, we were singing, and they asked me one Sunday to sing a solo. And I picked out a solo, um, a, a song, it was a folk song, called, Oh Lord, I'm Running to Meet You. And again, it's one of those songs, I don't remember when I first heard it, but I took my guitar and I played that and sang that song. And as I'm singing the song, I'm trying to remember, I know there's a passage where this, where this seems to fit. And I couldn't think of it at the time. And I said something to a friend and he says, yeah, there is, but I can't think of it either. So together we looked through scriptures and we finally found this verse, these verses. The story that Jesus tells of 
the day of judgment, what the kingdom of heaven will be like. And in some ways, as we read that story, it's a scary thought. Most of us have been raised with this Protestant idea of grace. We are saved by grace through faith. This is not our doing, it is God's doing. And we're told that there's nothing that we can do that can affect our salvation. Right? That's what we're taught. There's nothing that we can do. It's all up to God. God has already done it for us. And as Presbyterians, we believe in that idea of, of um, election or what we call it oftentimes predestination. That God has already chosen us before we were born for salvation. And so there's nothing we can do to, to affect that. And yet here in this story, Jesus says, the kingdom will, of heaven will be like this. When the king is set, seated on his throne, he's going to start dividing people. And he's going to divide them just like the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he's going to put sheep on one hand and goats on the other. He's going to put some people on the right and some on the left. And he's going to say to the people, all right, you did these things. Welcome. You didn't do these things. Go. That's scary. Because now all of a sudden, we have to think, am I doing the things that God asked me to do? Right? That becomes the question for us. How do I know when I have done enough, when I have done the things that God has asked me so that I'm on God's right hand? And I get that welcome. That's really the challenge. Here's the thing. Here's the thing that I would share with you because this does not sound like good news, which is what the gospel means, good news. It sounds very frightening for us. But I want to tie this passage of Scripture to a couple of other passages of Scripture and I want to take us kind of a little bit of a roundabout way to understanding what's really going on. And I'm going to take us back. I'm going to take us back before Jesus was born. I'm going to take us before the prophet Ezekiel, who we read. And I don't know how many noticed it. I misspelled it in the bulletin. Right? And I'm going to take us back before, even before Ezekiel, I'm going to take us back before King David. I'm going to take us clear back into the time of Joshua. And Moses. We've got to go back into Deuteronomy and Exodus to understand some of this. You recall in Exodus, Moses led the people of Israel and they got to Mount Sinai and there God gave them the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments actually begin not with commands about what we shall or shall not do. Right? We know those parts of it. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not... You know, those thou shalt nots. But they begin with something more important. They begin with God saying... I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Now that's a command, you shall. But it starts with, this is what I have done for you already. And we find that in Leviticus, 
You'd think the place where we get all the rules would not have it very, would have that very, uh, very badly, but we find it in Deuteronomy as well. And in Deuteronomy, we're told, you shall love the Lord your God. And in Leviticus, when we get every one of these commands about not doing this, that, or the other thing, which people love to throw in our faces and say, well, you're a Christian, you shouldn't do these things. Or this is how a Christian lives. And yet what it, begins, it starts with is, I am the Lord your God. In other words, God's first. And you shall love God. You shall love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, and when Joshua talks to the people before he, he leaves them, he reminds them, when we read this a couple weeks ago, when he talks about, you know, choose this day whom you will serve, he also says to them, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so we get those two commands, and, and now I'm going to jump way ahead to when Jesus is talking to the disciples, and, and somebody, a scribe, asks him, well, Lord, what are the two greatest commandments? We read this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it's slightly different in each, but all of them have basically the same thing. Jesus quotes the Shema, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other God. Or, um, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. And then he says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws hang all, on these two commands hang all the law and all of the prophets. This whole idea of loving God and loving your neighbor. And why is that important? How does that tie in with this passage from Matthew 25? Well, we take it the next step. And the next step is what we read in Ezekiel, among other places. When God says to the people of Israel, I'm going to appoint new shepherds over you. And so we get that image of the shepherd king. The shepherd who cares for the sheep. The king who cares for the people. Just like a shepherd cares for the sheep. And even in there we hear the shepherd separates the sheep from the sheep. From the sheep and he's going he's to make sure that all the sheep are taken care of. It's one of those really strange places in scripture Because what's going on? Again, we're having judgment. But what he's saying is, he says, you've had shepherds who are supposed to watch over and care for you. Prophets, kings, uh, rulers. But instead, they have done one thing. They have pushed you aside. They've, they've kept for themselves. They've taken care of themselves and not taken care of the sheep. So I'm going to put new sheep in charge. Sheep who listen to, or shepherds who listen to my voice, who will care for the sheep. Because that's the shepherd's job. And what happens? If a shepherd only cares for those who are the strongest, he starts favoring those and lets the other ones kind of die. Do you know what happens? Pretty soon the flock dies out. I know that seems strange. You would think, well, I'm going to take care of the, the strongest and I'm going to calm a herd and get rid of the weakest. But that does not work always. You need that variety. You need to take care of all of them. And if you take care of some of the weakest ones, believe it or not, it builds them up and it strengthens the whole flock of sheep. It seems counterintuitive, but we, we find this all the time in our world in business, right? When we have, uh, we find it in the sports world too, when we have a coach or when we have a team leader or when we have, have a, 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 a manager, an owner of a business who cares for the employees and sees them as valuable assets, what happens? They're more likely to stay, they're more likely to work harder, and they're more likely to be a successful company. When the owner only sees the employees as the same as a piece of equipment that they can use to get what they want, 
the employees don't want to stay around, and pretty soon that, that business starts to fail. And we see it in sports that the coaches who are able to look at their players and to help their players develop and to work with the players and to strengthen the players and see in them and lift them up and see in them the things that others miss, what happens? The players play harder and they develop and they become better teams. They may not win all of the games, but they are better teams down the road. And that's really what Ezekiel is pointing out. That as the shepherd builds up the flock, as it cares for all the sheep, it builds them up. And so the shepherd's going to separate sheep from sheep. And it's going to make sure that the weaker ones get what they need. He's going to look after everybody. He's going to see the needs of the flock. And so here we have Jesus using that same example. The same example of the sheep being separated from the goats. The same example of the shepherd doing that. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. This is what the day of judgment is going to be like. This is what the king is going to do on that day. The king is going to start separating. And the king is going to separate on the needs of the people that were served. You over here, you, you didn't look at the people around you. You didn't see their needs. You only looked after yourself, and so I'm going to push you aside Because these people over here, they did. They saw the needs of others around them. And they cared for them. And they did it not because they had to. Because, well, if I do this, then I'll get a few more brownie points in heaven. Or because uh, I'm going to get a few more brownie points on Facebook or TikTok or X or whatever social platform. Nope, that's not why they're doing it. They do it because within themselves, their hearts are transformed with gratitude and with love. For others. Came across a story of a of a man who who was a little low on funds, but he made his usual trip to the grocery store and was walking home carrying his bags of groceries. And as he was walking home, he was getting tired. And he looked and he saw the church down the road about a block or two. And he says, if I can make it there, I'll sit down on the steps and I'm going to rest a minute. And as he's walking, he's carrying his heavy groceries. And he looks down and he sees the banana on the top of the bag. And it was one of those things. He hadn't bought a fresh banana in a very long time. He had had limited funds. And he said, he, he was thinking to himself, you know, I haven't had anything besides fresh or frozen or canned vegetables or fruit or anything for a very long time. And I have just a little bit of money left. I'm going to buy me a banana. And he put it in there and he was looking forward as he was walking, carrying the bags. He was looking forward to getting home and taking that banana and and cooking it with cinnamon and a little bit of milk and some toast. Just like his mother had done. And he got to the church steps and he sat down on the steps to catch his breath, to rest for a minute before he finished the two or three blocks he had yet to walk to get home to his apartment. And as he's sitting there, an elderly woman walks out of the church and sees him sitting there She walks down and he turns and greets her, 
says, how are you today? And they have a little bit of a conversation. And as he's looking at her, he observes that she looks like she's really hungry. And he makes a comment about, or she makes a comment about the groceries. And he says, yes, I don't have a lot, but this, I was able to buy this much for, to get home and put on my shelf so I'll have meals. And he says, well, uh, how are you doing? And she says, well, I'm really well. I said, I had a good breakfast this morning. And he thought to himself, it doesn't look like she had breakfast this morning. Matter of fact, it doesn't look like she's really eaten for a day or two. And he looked down and he sees the banana. And he says, would you like to share my banana with me? And she says, oh no. She says, I'm fine. Supper, is, supper will be here soon. But he broke the banana in half and gave her part of the banana. And together they sat and they ate that banana. She says, I don't know that I've seen you around here. Oh, I live a couple blocks. Normally I take the bus, but I got impatient waiting for the bus this morning. And she says, oh yeah, I heard there was, there was a big traffic tie-up and that there was affecting traffic because of an accident or something like that. And he visited with her a few minutes more and then he got up to leave and she said, thank you. You're the first time I've sat and had a meal with somebody or the first person who's visited with me for a long time. And he says, you're welcome. And he picks up his bags and starts down the street. And when he looks back, he doesn't see anybody. But he goes home and he says, he remembers going to church. And he says, I'm going to have to start going to church. See if I can find her again. You see, he didn't give her the banana because, well, I need to do something to help a person in need because if I do it, I'm going to get to heaven. He did it because he saw a person in need. He saw a person. He saw a person. And his heart went out to her. We have, as a church, adopted Matthew 25. It's part of a Presbyterian-wide, Presbyterian Church USA program, the Matthew 25 church. It's got three focuses. I can never remember all three. Systemic poverty, uh, feeding those who are hungry, and, and uh, I forget the third one off the top of my head right now. But three different focuses. And we said, we are going to focus on this. And part of what we have been doing as our focus on that has been um, the noisy offerings that we don't go to the special offerings, go to the chicken, buying the chickens, a family of chickens for people. We continue to do that week after, or month after month as a way of saying we are going to support and reach out to those who are in need. We chose to be a part of the Matthew 25 initiative because we have a heart for, for our community and those in need. We see it in the long history with Manna Food Pantry, which we started and, and have supported for all, all these 40 plus years that, that we've been here. And we're going to continue to support it even after we move out of this building. We see it in, in the, the gifts of the backpacks, the school backpacks that we organize each year to give to kids. We see, we see it in the, uh, the kitchen gap ministry as, as we take kitchen supplies to people in their homes who are in need. We see the needs of our community and we have sought out ways to reach out and help others. Why would we do that? 
We do it because we hear stories like we read that Jesus told us about in Matthew 25. But even before that, we do it because we hear God's command to love God and to love our neighbor. A command that goes clear back before the Ten Commandments. We do it because we hear Jesus say, this is the greatest commandments, to love God and love our neighbors. And yeah, sometimes it doesn't make sense, this kindness, this goodness, this sharing. You know, that's not what we do in our world. We've got to take care of ourselves. But Jesus says, no. We don't take care of ourselves. We take care of others. We build those relationships. We see people who are in need. We see people who are longing to be loved and to listen, to be heard and to listen to. And we see people who are needing God's love. And so we don't do it because we're perfect. We do it because we have experienced God's love and somehow God has has reached into our hearts and into our lives and transformed us. Even before we were born, God was doing that in us. And that's the good news. That's the promise. Because what did Jesus say in the midst of this that we didn't hear? Jesus said, Enter into the reward that was prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Yep. You see, it's not what we're doing, even as we're caring for others. We're doing what God has put in us and prepared us to do before we were formed, before the foundation of the world. You see, that's what a king does. He looks and he sees the needs around him and acts before anybody else realizes it. That's why Jesus is our shepherd king. Because that's what the shepherd does. Looks at the needs of the sheep and takes care of problems even before the sheep realize there's an issue. And that's what our God does. He looks at the world and sees the needs in the world. And before we even realize it, he's already working within us. That we, you and I, can be instruments of God's work in this world. Sharing love. Caring for others making God's love known. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the one who sees the needs, who acts to lead us and to caring for those around us. And we give you thanks and praise. We truly look forward to that grand and glorious day when we stand before your throne We look forward to that day with humble hearts, realizing that we haven't done enough, but somehow you take what we have done and transform it and make it a glorious, glorious offering to you.
Help us. Help us to live each day trusting you, loving you, and loving our neighbors. To the glory of your name, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I invite you to join with me in our profession of faith. This morning our profession of faith actually is taken from uh, the brief statement of faith of the Presbyterian Church USA. Would you please rise and join with me? It is a responsive uh, profession this morning. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image for to live as one community. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, Everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, we bring to the Lord our tithes and our offerings, instruments that we use to share God's gift of love and grace, that all may know of God's love and all may know of God's love and glory. Let us rejoice as we bring our offerings forward, singing together the doxology. Let us pray. God of every good and perfect gift, we bring these gifts to you. Symbols of our work, of our time, of our talents, and set them before you to use as you see, to bless them through the work of this congregation, to show your love to all the world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We do come now to a time of prayer. Are there prayer concerns that you would like to share with the congregation? Yes, Peter. Okay. So for prayers for Corrine, who is pursuing some treatment options. All right. Others you wish to share this morning? Okay, prayers for Carol. Any others? I'm looking through. I, do, I did get my Facebook up here this morning, and I'm not seeing any prayer concerns on there, so. 
Let us come to the Lord in prayer. God of hope and love, we praise you this day. We praise you for your hand at work in the world. We hope, we hope that your hand will be an instrument of peace and healing and love. We rejoice in some of the, some of the activities that are bringing a little hope in the Middle East. The human aid, the humanitarian aid that is making its way, the temporary cessation of hostilities, the release of hostages. We pray that you will continue to work in the world to bring that peace. Not just the absence of conflict, but, but healing and hope. We pray, Lord, We pray for your hand at work in our world as we deal with other conflicts, as we deal with hatred and vitriol that is thrown around against other people just because of the color of their skin or their beliefs. We ask, we ask for your hand to provide support for those who are the uh, objects of hatred. And we pray for your hand to turn the hearts of those who are filled with hatred. We pray, O oh Lord, for your hand upon us in a world that is filled with hunger and sickness and we would pray that you would continue to open the eyes and provide for ways to feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are naked, care for those who are sick and in prison. In particular, we lift before you Carol and, and Corrine as doctors work with them. <clears throat> we pray for others in our congregation who are uh, fighting various illnesses and diseases. Lord, we think of that word disease and we're reminded of how it is actually the opposite of ease and pray for, for your spirit to provide ease, healing, comfort, and strength for all who are sick. Finally, Lord, we pray for your spirit, your spirit to rule in our hearts and in our minds, to open our eyes and our ears to see those in need around us. And we don't ask to see you, we just ask to be made aware of those who are in need, to help break down the barriers and to provide care trusting that you will, that you will be present in those who are in need. And that in caring for them, we may offer to you a little bit of what you have given to us. These things we pray, trusting in your Holy Spirit to make them come true through Christ Jesus who lives and reigns with you one God, our God, now and always. And in Christ's name we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and lead us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
Our closing hymn is found only in the purple hymnals. It's number 757 there. It's we, are, we all are called to be disciples. Uh, t- today we all are called to be disciples. Words and music are on the screen if you'd like to follow. Part of my benediction, I want to draw you back to what we sang earlier. Savior like a shepherd lead us. Normally when we, I'm sorry, not Savior like a shepherd lead us, I got the wrong one. Uh, let me see. To the Christmas carol, what we normally think of as a Christmas carol, it came upon a midnight clear. And I don't know if you listened or paid attention to the words as we were singing. Part of the reason I chose the version that's in the purple hymnal as opposed to the white one is because there's a verse where the words are completely different. And so it makes us think about the words because they're not words we oftentimes sing. But here were the words that we sang in the fourth verse. And you, beneath life's crushing load whose forms are bending low, who toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow. Look now, for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing, and rest beside the weary road 
and hear the angels sing. For days are hastening on by prophets seen of old, when with the ever-circling years shall come the time foretold, when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling, and the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing. May you, under life's crushing load, pause and rest and hear the angel's song. And in hearing the angel's song, recognize God's presence at work with you. And with God's presence at work in you, may you share that song with others as we care for God's sheep together, trusting that God who is faithful will bring to completion in you that great work he has begun through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.